This is the seventh video in the Edexcel P3 revision tutorials. Today we will be looking at ECG and pulse oximetry. In this tutorial we will look at explaining how action potentials are used to monitor heart action. We will look at how to calculate the pulse rate from an ECG trace and we'll have a look at the principles and use of pulse oximetry. So what are action potentials? Between the inside and outside of a muscle cell, there is a potential difference. This voltage at rest is called resting potential, and the difference can be measured and is usually around minus 70 millivolts. During exercise, this then changes as the muscle is stimulated to contract, where it changes to plus 40 millivolts. This increase in potential is called the action potential, and it is these two different voltages that we will be looking at in regards to ECG. Before we look at ECG in more detail, we first need to be able to identify the parts of the heart. The heart has two sides. It has the right-hand side and the left-hand side. When you are labelling a heart, remember that the right and left are the opposite way round to the way you are looking at the diagram. This means that the right-hand side of the heart will carry the deoxygenated blood, whereas the left-hand side of the heart will carry the oxygenated blood. Blood comes back to the heart through the vena cava before entering the right atrium. It then passes through valves to enter the right ventricle before exiting the right ventricle again through valves up and out through the pulmonary artery to the lungs. The pulmonary artery is significant as it is the only artery to carry deoxygenated blood. The blood returns to the heart from the lungs via the pulmonary vein, the only vein in the body to carry oxygenated blood before entering the left atrium. It then passes through valves into the left ventricle before exiting once more, this time through valves again, out to the rest of the body via the aorta. The aorta is the largest artery in our body. In order to measure the action potential, we need to measure two nodes. These are the SA node and the AV node. The SA node is located just to the side of the right atrium, whereas the AV node is located on the septum of the heart, which is between the right and left ventricles. We can then use this to measure the heart beat. In order to measure the heart voltage, we need to look at the electrical potential generated by the SA node and the AV node. Because the heart contracts via the use of electrical impulses, we can monitor the action of the heart using an ECG, which is an electrocardiogram, which produces an image such as this one here. This complex is known as the PQRST complex. To start with, our first action at P, we get a very small electrical activity as the blood is pushed through from the atrium down into the ventricles. At the major complex, the QRS complex, the electrical activity is much, much greater as it causes the ventricles to contract. The ventricles are much, much thicker as they will be pushing the blood around the lungs and the rest of the body, so a much larger action potential is needed. Finally, we get one final part at T, which is where the ventricles become repolarized so that the heart can beat again. If this step didn't happen, then the heart would be unable to beat again. We will now look at this in more detail. To start with, both of the atrium fill up with blood. The heart then contracts for the first time and the blood is pushed through from the atria 
into the ventricles. This is shown on the ECG trace as P. Once the blood is in both of the ventricles, the heart will contract once more. At this point, the blood will be pushed out of the heart around the body and to the lungs. This is shown on the ECG trace as the QRS complex. Finally, both of the ventricles will repolarize and the atria will fill back up with blood. This is our complex at T and then we are ready to beat again. For successive beats, we can then put together a full ECG graph to show the heart rate for a specific time period. We can then use this to look at the frequency of the heart rate, so the frequency for each beat. In order to do this, we use the equation 1 divided by the time period. The period is the amount of time between each peak in the QRS complex. Once we have worked out the frequency, we can then look at multiplying this by 60 in order to get beats per minute. At this step here, we have a frequency in beats per second. For a resting heartbeat, we would be expecting 80 to 120 beats per minute. For an exercising heartbeat, we would be expecting 160 to 180 beats per minute. The number of beats per minute and hence the heart rate is controlled by a pacemaker. The pacemaker is a small group of cells located on the right hand side of the heart that send out small electrical impulses to control the contractions of the heart. If the pacemaker fails then an artificial pacemaker can be fitted which can be programmed outside of the body to control the rate at which the heart contracts and hence the heart rate. We have looked at ECG scans. We also need to be aware of pulse oximetry. A pulse oximeter is a device used to measure the blood oxygen level and heart rate through a non-invasive method. We can see it clips onto the finger here. It works by sending two different frequencies of light through the finger, which are red and infrared. The absorbance of these wavelengths is measured by a photodetector. This can then be used to look at the blood oxygen level because oxygenated blood absorbs more infrared light than red light. Deoxygenated blood does this the other way around and absorbs more red light than infrared light. We can then use this information to look at the level of oxygenated blood in the body. So depending on the ratio of red to infrared light that is picked up by the photodetector, we can work out the saturation of oxygen in the blood. This can be used to make sure that the lungs are working. The higher the blood oxygen saturation, the better the lungs are working. This is the end of this tutorial video. In the next video, video 8, we will be looking at alpha, beta and gamma radiation as well as the creation of positrons.